to start a brand new series uh, today called Comeback Season. I, I really believe this. It is a prophetic declaration of a season that we have an opportunity to step into. And I say opportunity because I also believe that you have the opportunity to stay out of it. You got the opportunity to step into it. You also have the opportunity to stay out of it. I believe it's not a comeback Sunday. It's a comeback season, which I believe is an opportunity in time for us to take advantage of what God's doing in the world and what God's doing in our own personal lives, that any area where you've been disappointed, discouraged, distraught, that God will bring a comeback in your life. How many people need a comeback in some area? I need a, I need a comeback. This is comeback season. Uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 36. This is going to be our text for the series. It says, Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. Now this, is, this means he died. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. Now I want you to see something. When David had fulfilled his purpose, he did not die until his purpose was fulfilled. So this is what this means for each of us. If you've still got breath in your lungs, then you've got purpose in your life. If you've got breath in you right now, th this is the test. For all of you wondering, is God done with me? Have I gone too, too far, done too much? Have I went beyond the grace of Jesus? Just take a deep breath. If you got breath, you got purpose. That's encouraging, isn't it? No matter what's going on in my life, no matter what storms I'm facing, if I have breath in my lungs, then I also have purpose in my life. Some of you, uh, some of you are loud breathers. You know, you, you know the loud breathers, and you're in a movie theater, and it's like, my goodness, that's like just, just pipe it down. Or the loud slurpers. You know what I'm talking about? I can't be around those people. It's, I'm gonna help you with your marriage. Just drink quietly, okay? Like, don't annoy your spouse that way. But if, you're, if you've got breath in your lungs, you've got purpose in your life. In uh, 2016, the Cleveland Cla Cavaliers, LeBron James played for the Cleveland Cavaliers in this year, and the Golden State Warriors met in the NBA Finals. And uh, the Warriors had just completed uh, the record number of wins in a single season. They'd set a record. They were favorites to win the entire uh, championship. And uh, if you're a basketball fan, you love this. If you are not, then you're like, what are we even talking about? Just take a nap for like three minutes while we enjoy the beauty that was 2016. I'm just a competitive guy. I like any type of sports. I'll watch curling. As, as long as we're keeping score and there's a winner and a loser, I'm in. I mean, it doesn't matter. I'm watching the Little League World Series. I'm, wa I'm watching anything. And so, so I, I love the NBA. And so LeBron James on the Cleveland Cavaliers back in Cleveland playing Golden State Warriors. And the C Cleveland Cavaliers go down 3-1. It's a best of seven for those of you that don't know. Front row. Uh, Cleveland Cavaliers are down 3-1. No one has ever in history come back from a 3-1 deficit. Cleveland Cavaliers win game, the next game. They win the next game. They bring it all the way to game seven. This is the interesting thing about a comeback, is that there are strategic moments in a comeback where people begin to believe that it's possible. It, it, it's, you, can, you can be down so far that no one even believes you have a chance. They're down 3-1, and all the announcers are like, there is no way. It's never been done. LeBron's washed up. It's over. And then they win a game. And they're like, oh, you know, there's a slight chance, but we think it's over. Nobody can beat Steph Curry, which Steph Curry's incredible. We know he's probably the greatest shooter of all time. Uh, but all, I'm going to just let you know, there's other Christians in the NBA besides Steph Curry. I know he's the first one to write a scripture on his shoe, but he's not the only Christian in the NBA. Every, all the kids are like, we're Steph Curry fans because he's a Christian. Like, there's other Christians. All right? He's also a whiner. I mean, just, anyway, anyways, they all are. They all are. They all are. Okay. Little moments that spark hope to believe that a comeback is possible. Some of us, that's all we need today. It's just a little spark of hope. Just a, just a little spark of hope to say, you know what, maybe, maybe this could turn around. I, I remember watching the game. I was by myself and uh, watching the finals game. Everyone doesn't care or asleep. And, and uh, I'm like on the edge of my seat. And the last couple minutes of the game, game seven, to decide who wins the, wins the NBA championship, I'm actually going to show you this because this is one of the most athletic plays 
just pivotal moment. I got to show you. It's all, Sunday morning is all right. You guys go ahead. Show it. On James, the offense is running through me right now. Irving drives, hop step inside, blows it up, misses. Rebound taken by Iguodala. Iguodala to Curry, back to Iguodala, up for the layup. Oh, blocked by James. LeBron James with the rim. Oh my goodness. Let's just see it one more time. Great pass by Curry, running hard by Iguodala. And superhuman defensive recovery by LeBron James. Superhuman, real similar to me, like in fifth grade. <laughs> but in that, in that moment, Cleveland went crazy. LeBron fans went crazy. That was it. Every, some, some of you are nodding your head like, I remember. That was it. All the Golden State fans like, we knew as well. Yeah, it's, it's over for you. It's just, it, was, it was going down. They came back and they won. Uh, first team in NBA history to come back from 3-1 and win the NBA championship. A spark of hope that brought belief and faith in hearts to believe that a comeback was possible. I believe that today is a prophetic setup for you, for your life, for your future, for your marriage, for your job, to be a supernatural spark of hope into your heart that says a comeback is possible. How many believe that? That a comeback is possible. First Samuel chapter 30, verse 1, it says, David and his men, this is an Old Testament story, uh, Old Testament names are crazy, and uh, here we go, David, he's a fighting man, he's a warrior. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them. Just pause this just for a second, because someone's going to get a prophetic word right now. Whenever the enemy has the audacity to capture you but fail to kill you, he's in trouble. I, I'm, I'm just going to, we got to finish the scripture, but I'm going to tell you something. The greatest mistake of the enemy is to leave you half dead. Because what did we say? If there's breath in your lungs, then there's purpose. He should have killed you when he had the chance. It says that they killed no one. But they took them captive. All right, y'all aren't into it yet, so I'll just keep going. I'm more excited than you are. But carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been... <laughs> Old Testament... Uh... We can all identify some of David's problem right here. It's like, bro, we need a singular focus here. Da David, his two wives had been captured. Ahinoam and Je of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. I want you to catch that. They were bitter in spirit because of his, so they're mad at David. They're mad at David. They're bitter because of their sons and daughters, but they're directing their anger towards David. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Now listen to this. Pursue them, he answered, and you will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. You don't have to live very long to realize that this life is not just a game. This life is a fight. This life is a battle. Paul said it. He said, fight the good fight of faith. Paul, in all his boldness and his arrogance and his bragging about all of the things he does and doesn't do, if he says that life is a fight, it's a fight. Life is a fight. John chapter 10 verse 10 says a thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Now I want you to catch this. Anything that's stealing from you, killing you, or destroying you is not from God. Some people think, well, this is God's punishment on me. This is the consequence of heaven. This is God's wrath. This is, 
The enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And it says, and I have Jesus come that you may have life and have it to the full. When you start f- talking about the fight of life, you've got to recognize from the very beginning who does what. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and Jesus comes to bring life, and that life more abundantly, or life to the full. Now, this is interesting. David is out fighting a battle in our text. He's with his warriors. He's with his buddies. He's with his friends. He's with his comrades. They're on the front lines of a battle, and they are winning. If you know historically, David's taking ground. David was a force to be reckoned with, and the, 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 all the while that he's winning At work, he's losing at home. When I talk to people about this last year and the ups and the downs and disappointments and discouragements and and economic downturns and unrest and confusion, I I, I realize more than ever before that, that you can win in one area and you can lose in another area at the same time. I talk to men all the time that COVID open their eyes to all kinds of scenarios because when they won at work, it was while they were at work, but when they no longer went to work, but they're in the home, now something else was exposed because they were winning at work and losing at home, but work was a hiding place to not confront the losing pattern of their life, but now they're confronted and confined in the same room, and they realize that you can win and lose at the same time. David was a warrior who was winning at work, but he was losing at home. He's out there on the front lines of obedience, of taking ground, of winning the battle. He's moving forward, and all the while, his home is being ransacked. This is what the text says. It says that his home was raided. Raided. You, you, you do not rob someone that doesn't have someone something to give. The enemy will always target places of value to steal from. So they're coming and raiding. They were raiding because there was something there to take. Can I I give you like a a hack of of spiritual warfare hack? The place that the enemy is attacking is actually the place of your greatest potential and the place of your could be greatest authority and possibly the place of your greatest ministry. But the enemy lies to us to tell us because we're attacked in this area, we must have made the wrong decision. We must have married the wrong person. We must have, but friends, I would propose to you that in the height of spiritual warfare, God is using the enemy to identify the place of greatest strength because the enemy is not stupid. Although he is, although he, we know he will be defeated, he is not stupid in his tactics and he will rob from places of value. Sometimes the enemy will recognize your gift faster than you do. The enemy is better at recognizing your potential than we are. And he'll attack the places of potential. The enemy knew how to attack David. Attack him at home. The enemy knows how to attack us. Attack us at home. Says they were, he was raided. Says they burned the city. They burned the city. Is there any, I want you to think about this. Is there any situation, person, belief that you have been burnt by? You ever been burned by somebody? You ever trusted someone and they broke your trust or broke your heart? Burn. Well, you know what's interesting about an actual burn? Sometimes a burn can be so severe, obviously you feel it in the moment, but it actually does so much damage to the nerves. What was once feeling so sensitively now does not feel at all. And I find this to be true as people walk through life as they're burnt by people. Instead of becoming more sensitive, they become deadened. And now they'll never open their heart again. They'll never trust again. They'll never step out in faith again because the nerves that were once so sensitive have been burned. And now what was once open to God and open to people and open to the work of the ministry is now deadened. It's been burnt by life, by the attack of the enemy. It says that they were taken captive. Come on, I want you to think about this. Is there any situation? Is there any theology? Is there any person? Is there any persuasion that has taken you captive and pulled you away from victory in Jesus? Pulled you away from a victorious life? Pulled you away from overcoming? Pulled you away from faith? 
pulled you away from peace, pulled you away from joy, pulled you away. You know, life has a way of teaching us to settle. I mean, think about this. We, we work with young people all the time, and, and young people with relationships, it's, it's so fun. You know, I mean, it's just like, it's, it's crazy. They've known each other two days, and they're like, we're ma- going to get married, have six kids, we're going to whatever. And it's like, whoa, do you know what you're saying right now? You're never going to sleep again. You're going to be poor. You're going to be, I mean, it's like, you know, you don't get it till you're there, right? It's like, we're in love. Like, uh-huh. And then the, those of us later in life, we, we, we know, you know, like how life goes. And you settle in. And I talk to marriages all the time, and people say, well, you know, we, we found a good rhythm. What they're saying is we're both unhappy, but we're settling. Right, right? It's just like we've just figured out that life is just this way. She's just never going to be that. He's never going to be that. That's just what we have. And I would propose to you that God's plan was never to get you a status quo life or a barely getting by life, or a life that you're just somewhat happy with, or to get you to settle into a rhythm where you no no longer contend for the goodness of God in your life, and in your family, and in your marriage, and in your kids. Wouldn't it be a smart tactic of the enemy to get so much disappointment to hit your life that you live in a place of perpetual discouragement, and instead of contending for what God has, you settle for what is? It says the city was burned, they were taken captive. And this is what the text says. It says that the men turned against David. David, David's their guy. David's their king, he's their warrior, he's their pastor, he's their commander-in-chief. They've been fighting battles, they've been winning, winning battles together. And now they come home, and because they were attacked and they couldn't place it on the enemy This is what I find to be true a lot of times, is we just fight the wrong battle. Friendly fire happens in places where we misidentify the enemy. And we think that it's this person, but it's really not even them at all, but it's something that happened to us a long time ago, but now we're projecting out of the place of her. And you, You have to be careful. You ever heard that phrase, become better, not bitter? It says in the text this is that these men were, and they became bitterly angry at David. Their hearts became bitter. And it says, not because, not because it was David's fault, they became bitter because something from them was stolen. They lost something in themselves. And because they had no enemy to strike, they had to strike someone, so they chose David. You have to be really careful. In times of conflict, in times of discouragement, in, in, in times of oppression or, or disappointment, that you don't fight the wrong battle. You've got to be very careful that you don't give yourself to friendly fire. When you, who you blame for your disappointments will determine the enemy that you fight. I'll say it again for you. Who you blame for the disappointment. Well, if he would have just, hold on, hold on. Who are we blaming? Who you blame for the disappointments, identify the enemy that you're going to fight. And at times, as Christians, we have misidentified the enemy, and we're killing each other, killing other churches, killing other pastors, killing spouses, because we think they're the enemy. And friends, I've got news for you. There is a battle behind the battle. I've got a message for you. The enemy's tactic is to get you to fight the wrong enemy. But it's time to wake up and realize that we live in a time of spiritual warfare. There is a battle behind the battle and the enemy comes to steal, to kill and to destroy and I'm telling you it is time to stop beating yourself up for things you've been through I feel the spirit of God in this room for things you've been through, things you've done things that have been done to you and get on with your life because I'm going to tell you something, it was the enemy's plan that robbed you, it was the enemy's plan that burnt you, it was the enemy's plan, yeah you may have participated in it, but God doesn't doesn't put a period on your life when you make a mistake he doesn't close the chapter or close the book when you have had some type of failing, in fact We see that God is the most gracious, the most compassionate, the most full of mercy God you can ever imagine because he's using David. So you thought I was just trying to hype you up? No, he's using David. David. 
I, I like David because I read the Psalms. You know, it's like, God, where are you? You left me. But I'll worship you forever. You're my rock. <laughs> and the reason I like him is because I can relate a little bit, you know, like high highs and low, low lows. But I also like David because I'm like, I'm not as bad as you. <laughs> Everybody likes David. Oh, little shepherd boy bringing meat and cheese and killing Goliath. Also murderer, <laughs> rapist, adulteress. And, and yet, I want you to hear something. And yet, he was declared a man after God's own heart. So here's the question. How can someone that did that have a, man, uh, have a heart that's after God, God's own heart? Psalm 51, you see David broken, crushed. We're going to be talking about it in a couple of weeks. He says, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right. Friends, it's not always about your perfect behavior. It's about the posture of your heart that senses and feels what God senses and feels and breaks for what breaks his. God's not looking for perfection. God's looking for hearts that are towards him. And David, although we can judge him, I mean, there's a lot to judge. He's got multiple wives. <laughs> he's not even treating those wives good. He's going out on the, I mean, just, he's, he's, got, he's got craziness happening in his life. But his heart was after God. Dr. Maiden, one of our friends, comes and speaks for his pastor in Arizona. He says, forgive the people who have hurt you, and he'll anoint you to forget the pain they've caused you. For most people, they get stuck at the place of disappointment. They become bitter like David's men, and they cannot move on with the good things that God has for them. Dr. Maiden, who's been through all kinds of pain and betrayal, he says, if you forgive the people who've hurt you, God will anoint you to forget the pain that they've caused you. Anoint is God's super on our natural. I know what some of you said. It's like, well, I can't forget it. No, it's not you. It's a supernatural power, strength that comes on you to be able to forget pain that someone caused you because you've released them through forgiveness. I see too many people getting eaten up by the enemy because they're holding offenses against one another and you can never let someone in as long as you hold something against them. If I hold something against you, you can only get within arm's length. I've got to drop the offense and allow myself to get close to people again. And the church is being divided. The capital C church is being divided by offense because people have become bitter. And they fought the wrong enemy. Says David is at the end of himself, drained of strength. You know what's interesting to me is that for many of us, we live in a condition or a posture of accepted defeat which means we try to win in the areas that we can win, but the areas that we're losing, we just try to accept them. Try to just not look at them. Try to not pay attention to them. And I'll, I'll never get victory in that area, but that's all right. It's, it's now an accepted defeat area. So I'm going to manage. In, in your purity, you should not live in accepted defeat. I, I'm just going to tell you, well, I'm doing better than I did before. That's how men in accountability, it's hilarious. Men in accountability are, are just, they, they're really funny. Because they never have a bad day. It's always like, well, last week was pretty tough. But then you go the next week, and you're like, how were you last week? It's like, oh, it's awful, man. I was like suicidal. It was crazy. Like, we met last week. But they're never, they're never bad in the moment. It's always, they can't be honest, you know. Not you, just other men, other places. <laughs> Consistent disappointment leads to perpetual discouragement. Consist storm after storm, loss after loss, leads to consistent, perpetual discouragement. And David is at the end of his strength. And this is what the text says. It says, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. That'd be discouraging. It's like, they're going to kill me. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. It says, but David found strength in the Lord his God. Why does it always take us so long to find strength in God? I mean, even David, he waits till they're going to kill him. And they're like, oh, wait, whoa, hey, God, I need some strength. This is us. This is totally us. 
We live our life, and when we're at the brink of disaster, God, I'll do anything. And then God comes through like he always does. We're back on our feet. We forget about God until it hits us again. And then, oh, God, here we are again. How, how, about, how about this? How about this? Just like a rhythm of relying on God. Here we go. This is, like, this, this, this is, good, this is good theology right here. Like, like a, a consistent rhythm. So don't just come to church when you've been so bad, you better get to church this Sunday. Don't just give when the pressure's on so much and I need a miracle. Why don't you just find a rhythm of walking in victory, in walking in purity, in walking in obedience? You know, I, I'm just going to help you. I, I, I like to work out. I like to stay in shape. I'm going to tell you this. If you just work out like whenever things get really bad, you will never be in shape. I'm just like, every, every December 26th, you're like, that's it. New year, new me, baby. <laughs> it's not going to work. It's the consistency that yields results. It would be better for you to do a little bit every single day than every January kill yourself. It's the, it's the rhythm. It's the rhythm. David found strength in the Lord his God. You don't have to do it when you're on the brink of discouragement or depression. You can find strength today. You can look to him right now. You can look to him tomorrow. You can look to him next week. You can every day find strength. How do you find strength? How do you, how do you, I mean, sounds good. David found strength in the Lord his God. It sounds good. How does it live? I'm going to tell you two ways. We look to him. And we lean on him. I'm going to show you how it works practically. Jamie was just gone teaching at a Bible school in 10 days. She was gone. I was home with the boys. Only problem is I can't cook anything. Not the microwave. Not the restaurant. Nothing, man. It's just me. And I can't even decide. I'm like, oh, my. So many. No. The boys are starving. One day I tried to make them, I tried to make them spaghetti, like noodles. She would taste it. And he's like, man, Dad. You really don't know how to make these noodles like mom, do you? I'm like, no, I don't, son, but mine's a different flavor. Just try it out. Maybe you'll like it. He tried it. He's like, it's really bad. I'm like, okay, forget it. Forget it. I'm going to IHOP. That's the, one thing I, that's the one thing I got. They look to mom because mom delivers. That's how you find strength. That, it was, it's really little. If you're sleeping for a second, you just missed it. It's super... They look to her, and they lean on her. This is how we draw strength from God. It's not super fancy. It's not super theological. It's not super educated. It's just, I look to him, and I lean on him. That means the other things that I'm looking to, I don't look to. Some people say, well, I look to God. No, you don't. No, you don't. You look to yourself. You look to your money. You look to your popularity. When you look to God, you know when you look to God. And it's usually when we're at our wit's end, unfortunately. But when you look to God and you lean on God, you will find strength that you never, know, never knew that you had. Strength that comes from, and this is what David found. I got good news for you. Discouragement is the greatest. That's not the good news. It's coming. When breakthrough is the closest. D discouragement gets the worse right before it's about to break. So good news, if you came in today and you're discouraged, that's a great place to be. Because your breakthrough is so close, and you just walked into a house of breakthrough, and you just walked into a season of comebacks where the power of God is going to regenerate and reinvigorate your life and your heart and your spirit and your ministry. I'm telling you, this is a house of comebacks. It's a house of comebacks. David was discouraged because people left him, his friends turned on him, his family was gone, but he found strength in the Lord. In verse 8, it says, So David inquired of the Lord, this is in the New King James Version, so shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered them, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them. And there's a switch in words in this translation. And without fail, recover all. Re recover all, it's, it's a pretty cool thought because it doesn't mean I'm going to barely get by. It means I'm going to get back what he took from me. Every hour of sleep that he stole when I st was stressed out. All of my joy that he stole from early years of childhood. All of my peace that he stole from my marriage. Every, th he says he's going to, I love it. He could have just said pursue him, pay him back, kick their rear ends. 
No, he says, David, don't do all that and not get back what he took. This is what Christians do sometimes. It's like, yeah, we're going to stand against the devil. We're going to stand against the devil. And, 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 and we do. And that's about it. Made a, had a good dance, had a good Sunday. And we go about our life. Nobody ever got it back. What, where's that thing that, that drew you? Where's that thing that, where's that voice that called you in the ministry? Where's that, where was that, where's that, that, where is it? Where did we lose it? Who took it? Who knocked the wind out of you? Who took the wind out of your sail? You gotta find it. And David found strength in the Lord, his God. He said, he said, I want you to pursue. Now this is what pursue is. Pursue is mental. It's a mindset. Pursuing is a mindset. It, it is the belief that it's possible. If you don't believe it's possible, it's not going to work. It's not going to happen. I'm gonna tell you, I'm, I told you already I'm a super competitive guy, and um, I have problems with team sports. <laughs> Mostly because if you're on my team and you don't believe that we can win, either you're not on the team or I'm not on the team because we cannot coexist. <laughs> All right? I can't have that negativity in my life. I don't care if it's 11 to 0. I don't care what the score is. is if you don't believe that there's a comeback in here, it's over. It's over. It's a mindset. I teach my boys playing soccer, no matter how, how far they're behind, I'll tell them. They, they'll be behind a couple goals. They'll come to me. I'm like, look in my eyes. I'm like, what do you need to do? We need to believe. <laughs> That's right. We always believe. You ne and as long as there's breath. In, or time on the clock, breath in my lungs, then there's purpose for my life. Pursue, it's a mindset. Overtake is the next thing he says. I want you to overtake. Now, this is action. There's a lot of people that are all about pursuing. Let's pursue the enemy. Yes. But they never do anything. It's like this. Let's get out of debt. But they never move. Let's get in shape. But you never it's a great idea. It's a mindset. It's possible, but you have to take a step. You, you, you've got to do the work. You've got, to, you've got to step out in faith to overtake it. This is action. Faith without works is dead. You've got to make a move. You've got to have some type of forward momentum. Well, I don't know if, I'm, I don't know if it's going to work. Just move. It's called faith. It's, you ever heard that phrase, dress like the job you want? Pre-COVID, it was a real thing. Now it's not. Everyone's buying sweatsuits. <laughs> it, dress like the job you want is an idea of I'm going to get, I'm going to dress myself to look like, to feel like the position that I want to be in. Faith is somewhat like that. It is taking a strong stance against anything that's not and saying, I will be healed. I will have joy. Well, I don't feel joy. Well, you can whine about it all you want, or you can start declaring that. See, some people say, well, I don't want to be one of those hyper-faith people that say, like, I do have joy when I don't have joy. So what are you going to be? Like a super realistic person that just says, I don't have joy? You sound fun to be around. <laughs> Let's go grab coffee. This should be fun. Like... This is not about, high, this is about a posture that says, God, you said it was possible. You said it was available. I'm going to take it. So I'm going to pursue. That's my mindset. I'm going to overtake. That is my action step, but this is it. I'm also going to recover. Now, I love this. I love this because recover, recover is like an attitude. So all you polite Christians, you pursue and you overtake. But some of you, you like, were like real heathens before Jesus. I love you. You know what I'm saying? Like it's a little bit of attitude. Like how dare you? Devil, how dare you come at me? How? I'm going to get fired up if I start trash talking to you. Like how dare you think that you can come into my house and take my marriage and take my kids and my, how dare you have the guts to step into my relationship with God and try to bring doubt? How dare you step into my bedroom and rob me of my peace? How dare you? This is an attitude. When God told David, recover it all, it was an attitude piece. It wasn't just go pay him back for what they did. He says, go get your wife back, wives. Go get your kids back. Go get your land back. Go get your possessions back. And you will... I'm going to read it to you because I don't know if you believe me. It says in 1 Samuel 30, 18, David recovered 
everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. Everything, 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 everything. All the confidence that the enemy tried to steal from you. All of the faith the enemy tried to take from you. All of the joy of living that the enemy tried to take from you. The love for people that the enemy tried to take from you. The trust in people that the enemy tried to take. Every single thing. Go get it back. Go go get it back. And this is what this is what Christians usually do. Oh yeah, Jesus, bring it back, please. That'd be awesome. And they come in and see people crazy dancing around and they're like, "Whoa, that's a, that's a lot." No. The devil's taking too much from me. Man, you're preaching it's a little loud. Yeah, the devil tried to take a lot from me. You don't know me. You don't know my life, my story. The devil tried to steal from me. Oh, he tried to come in my house and take what was mine. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. I can't, I can't give God just a silent worship or a silent praise. I can't give him some passive obedience. I came to get back what the devil tried to take from me. I'm coming for you, devil, because my God came to give me life and that life to the full. It's comeback season, baby. This is the momentum shift. This is the moment. Everything changes. A spark of hope comes into your life that you can believe it's possible.